Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Activity Strong webinar. My name is Megan McMahon, and I am the Director of Strategic Development here at Link Senior. For today's webinar, we will be providing you with one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZSRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for the CEU credits, you do need to remain on this webinar for the full hour. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. And I will also send that CEU link to you by email this afternoon. So please be sure to check your spam folder in case it lands there. This CEU survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. And if you have any questions, please email us at webinars at linksmere.com. Your CEU certificates will be issued before the end of the day on Friday, October 28th this week. And I will now go ahead and hand it over to Charles D. Vilmorn, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles. Thank you so much, Megan. And uh, welcome everyone. This uh, Activity Strong uh, webinar is brought to you by Link Senior and uh, through our great partnership also with Activity Connection, NAP and NCAP. Like Megan mentioned, my name is Charles D. Vilmorn. And, um, I'm very excited about today's webinar. Um, I personally have a deep uh, passion and I'm very fond of every type of innovation in the field of dementia care. And this will definitely bring some of that today. So um, excited to have Dr. Jennifer Stalter and Jessica Ryan. Let me share with you a little bit of background on who we are before we get started with today's program. Like Megan mentioned, my name is Charles Zidomo and I'm um, I, I, I'm very honored to have started Link Senior 15 years ago. And a couple of things about myself. One is when I started to develop Link Senior, I got some of the best advice possible, which was to go and uh, follow a little bit of the activity professional certification. So that's, that's how I got the MEPAP 1 through VHEA here in Virginia more than 10 years ago. And I believe that old people are cool and that our industry is activity strong. Just a couple of things about these uh, as these um, initiatives. They're really kind of rooted in our values here at Link Senior. So old people are cool, like you might have thought, is, uh, is a way for us to give back and support and fight and, uh, ageism. We believe that everyone is cool, including uh, the residents, our elders, the residents we serve. And Activity Strong, if you're not aware, is a very large platform that we uh, started, initiated at the beginning of the pandemic, a little more than two years ago, as a way for us to give back, uh, support the industry, and really do something where we feel essential, which is to acknowledge the amazing work of most of you, like activity and life enrichment professionals, but also try to empower you with some of the best education, including today's, and give you tools to help you do more of what you like to do, which is to engage uh, the residents. A little bit of background about Link Senior. We're grateful of the uh, 50, more than 50,000 lives that we touch every day through amazing partners like some of the ones displayed on the screen. We have a 97% renewal rate. And again, our job is simply to help you do more of what you love to do, which is to engage your residents. If you haven't considered it before, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you and your organization on how we can help you elevate the experience you're providing to your residents. So that's a little bit about us. Um, you know, we're very proud of the fact that we're quote unquote evidence-based. So we did a full clinical study um, that lasted for a year in the memory care environment with some amazing outcomes, which I'm sure are outcomes that your organization and residents will benefit from. So in that kind of line and, um, and direction. Let me share a little bit about the, uh, the, the presentation today. So it is titled The Perfect Day in Dementia Care. And as some of, my, some of you might be aware of, you know, dementia care is not simple. Obviously it's come a long way in the last 15 years since I started in senior, but there's still numerous challenges that kind of keep our residents from living a perfect day. So that's gonna be our first objective today 
The other objective, the second objective is we're going to review the dementia connection model and understand how to utilize the framework to create this perfect day. And then with the help of Dr. Salter and Jessica Ryan, we'll outline the key sensory stimulation tools that can be used and paint the picture of the perfect day. So without further ado, we'd love to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer Salter, who's a co-owner co and CEO of Neuro Essence at the Dementia Connection Institute and her partner, Jessica Ryan. And with that, I'll uh, let you both take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Excited about your presentation. Thank you so much, Charles. We're really excited to be here today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And so, you know, first again, thank you for having us. And I just wanna say also a thank you to everybody here today, everybody in the industry who's able to catch this after, if you weren't able to catch it live, thank you for all that you do. Um, I work in, you know, several facets in the senior living industry and it's just amazing what our rec and activity uh, folks do on a daily basis because you bring light and love and uh, really enrichment to everybody every day. So thank you so much. Um, a little bit about our institute quickly. Uh, we opened up the Dementia Connection Institute here in January of this year, so we're fairly new. Um, us as NeuroEssence, we've been around for a couple of years, focusing a lot on brain health and how to age gracefully, but we shifted our focus as uh, uh, definitely my research has come to light and, and things that I've done and been able to publish with Johns Hopkins. And so we ended up developing the Dementia Connection Institute um, in this institute, we're the very first institute to really offer our services to not only professional caregivers, but to family caregivers as well. So we're very proud about that. We provide a lot of education and training. Uh, we actually just launched two certification programs, uh, which we'll talk about here towards the end if you're interested. Uh, we launched that here in the summer. Uh, we also do a lot of one hour CE presentations for staff training, community presentations, marketing presentations, and so on and so forth. We also um, have been doing a lot of podcasts and publications throughout the year and being able to partner with just some wonderful people in the industry. So we're excited to keep doing that um, as well as we provide a consultation. So we provide a dementia consultation to uh, senior living communities as well privately to family care caregivers who are looking for that one-on-one -on -one support. And so that's what we do here at the Institute. We really truly believe in our vision that if we can educate and put tools in the hands of those caregivers, that the people living with dementia can live a world freely without constraints, controls, negativity, and judgments. They can live a life with positivity, uh, quality of life, right? Because the more that we adjust and we change and we educate ourselves, they're able to live freely. So our mission is really to do that by educating as many people as possible. And with the certification programs we develop, we're able to do that to be able to reach as many people as we can. So we're excited to bring you um, our services uh, here today. So let's dive in. Let's learn about how prevalent uh, this disease is. And maybe many of you know about these stats, but you know these tend to change each year. Uh, more than 6 million Americans are, effectively, are currently affected by Alzheimer's disease. And by 2050, they're actually estimating over 16 million Americans. And can you believe that someone actually develops this disease every 33 seconds? Wow, that's just, it's just unbelievable. It is the number one diagnosis in seniors and one in three seniors do pass away with this disease, unfortunately. So what is dementia? Um, you know, we all come from different uh, experiences, different levels of education regarding this. So I just wanted to kind of briefly talk about what dementia is, is as it's a neurocognitive disorder and it's either mild or major in nature. Now, dementia is not the diagnosis itself. It covers a broad range of symptoms. So it's a very general term. Think of dementia as like the term mental illness, right? There are many different types of mental illnesses that we know of, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and so on. Dementia is the same way. There's many different types of dementias, like Alzheimer's disease is the first and most common one, right? Two thirds of all cases um, are those with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there's different ones like frontal temporal, Lewy bodies, um, you know, mixed dementias, right? There's all kinds of dementias. There's actually over 100 different types, if you can believe it. So the term dementia is actually a, a group of symptoms, right? So it means a loss of mental functioning with deficits in potentially memory, language, learning ability, judgment, and orientation. 
So depending on which symptoms they have, that would more so point to what type of dementia they have, okay? So what happens as the person is progressing through the disease? And we're gonna kind of dive into this when we talk about the dementia connection model more, but these types of behavioral expressions that you see here on the slide are ones that are pretty common with Alzheimer's disease as the disease progresses. Now, some other forms of dementia do include these symptoms, uh, but these are prevalent to those with Alzheimer's. And so when we talk about depression or repetitive behaviors, wandering, aggression, right? What these are, are a new way of that person trying to communicate, right? They're showing you something's wrong through their behaviors and or they're coping, right? They're trying to protect themselves. They're trying to understand their, what's going on in front of them. They're trying to gain some type of control, right? And they're doing it through the use of these behavioral expressions. Um, so when we talk about these, we understand that these behavioral expressions seem to show that the person is in distress, right? Something's wrong. So we don't want those living with dementia to experience these kinds of behavioral expressions, right? We want them to live in a world where they seem to be happy. They seem to be safe. They seem to be secure, right? So let's talk about that, right? What would that perfect day look like? So I ask you, um, you can put in the chat box or you can put in the Q&A, what would be the perfect day? You know, what would that look like for the person you're caring for that's living with dementia? Whether you have a resident in mind or you have a loved one in mind, what would that look like, right? So just go ahead and put in the chat box a couple of ideas, whether it's what kind of thoughts would you want them to have or what kind of emotions would you want them to have or maybe in behaviors, right? What would you want them doing every day, okay? So go ahead and include those in the chat box. You know, so I've got, uh, some people are saying, they would want clarity, right? They would want someone to feel like they are knowing what they're, what's going on in the very moment, right? Clarity of life. I see safety. I see happiness. I see love. I see joy. I see peace. Oh my gosh, I'm like getting, I'm tearing up here. Contentment, right? These are all, this is what would be what the perfect day would be. So how do we create that, right? How do we create the perfect day? So I introduced to you the dementia connection model. So the perfect day is built within the, the, excuse me, the dementia connection model. Jessica and I have developed um, the perfect day um, based on research that I had done um, through a focus group that was in 2006. Um, we had been able to uh, piece together um, a different uh, parts of a program implemented within a dining experience and be able to collect some really great data on that. Um, but before going into that, let's start with the overarching, what is the Dementia Connection Model? So the, the Dementia Connection Model, I developed this over really a 10-year period of working alongside people living with dementia and working with staff in senior living communities and their families. And I had the opportunity to be able to do this over that period of time and really see it come to light. Um, so without further ado, I want to show you what that is. Jen, I think we need to connect to the sound. Um, you can't hear the sound? Uh, no, I think there should be a button that you can enable uh, for the video when you go to play it through Zoom. Um, um, Jen, this shows when you share, you should unshare your screen and then share it again. And when you share your screen at the bottom left, there's a checkbox that says share with sound. Unshare your screen. Okay. And then share it again. Yeah. Yeah, and then share and then click uh, share sound, share with sound. Sorry. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> and then put it, at, yeah, back at the, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah let's go ahead and do that. Thank you. This may be familiar to you. All too often you want the best for the person you care for, but time and time again, the interaction just doesn't seem successful. 
leaving you feeling less connected to the person and potentially sad, frustrated, and hopeless. The Dementia Connection model brings together three known pillars in dementia care into one framework, the three-year retrogenesis, the act of habilitation, and using sensory stimulation to create sensory-based information for the person with dementia. The first pillar of the Dementia Connection model is the theory of retrogenesis, created by Dr. Barry Reisberg. This theory says a person with Alzheimer's disease loses brain functions in the reverse order that they learn them. Therefore, all their skills will go in reverse from adulthood to infancy, like how they walk, talk, take care of themselves, cope with stress, etc. Consequently, their chronological age will eventually not match their developmental age. Dr. Reisberg found that those with more advanced Alzheimer's disease may be in a state where their developmental age is anywhere between seven years old to four weeks old. So, although you may be taking care of someone with dementia who is 80 years old, they may have the skill abilities of a young child. However, his theory does not support treating the elderly like children, although the acceptance of the person's current skill abilities is crucial to understanding what they can and cannot do and to lower the expectations that the caregiver may have the person with dementia. This allows you as the caregiver to be fully present, not blocked by thoughts that lead to sadness, frustrations, and hopelessness. The second pillar of the dementia connection model is the act of habilitation. Simply put, it is important to consistently reinforce the skills the person still has. There are two known skills a person with dementia has as a disease progresses. One, because we know their skills are reversing toward a younger state, they will navigate their new world similarly to how infants then children navigate theirs, using their senses to take in sensory-based information. Young ones will use their senses to learn meaning, and then when things are called, from the use of auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile stimuli. Two, they can still feel a full range of emotions. Although they may not be able to express those feelings through words, they try to communicate them through behavioral expressions, similar to how children communicate before they know and understand words to describe their feelings. To put these together, stimuli from the outside either directly or indirectly influences the limbic system of the brain, which houses our mood and memory. So stimuli can influence our emotions and our memories. When we reinforce our emotional and memory skills in a positive way over and over again, those skills will stick around for much longer. Also, specifically the person with dementia will start to associate those positive feelings with you who is providing the positive stimulation, creating a deeper connection. Therefore, the third pillar of the dementia connection model is using positive sensory stimulation to create the sensory-based information for the person with dementia to take in that will influence their emotional and memory skills. So your approach should be using various sensory techniques that are positive and preferred by the person, like playing their favorite music for auditory stimulation, using essential oils that have therapeutic benefits for olfactory stimulation, offering their favorite foods for gustatory stimulation, reminiscing with pictures for visual stimulation, and painting for tactile stimulation. You can influence the person with dementia to feel happy, safe, secure, and calm, and also to be more focused and attentive. How great is that? The key to using the Dementia Connection model is the three R's, routine, remind, reward. Essentially, consistently use sensory stimulation cues and it will boost the mood and memory of the person with dementia, and they will feel more connected to you. Also, a bonus, when you feel you've mastered this, then it will also boost your mood too, and you will feel connected again to that person. So the, really the, the dementia connection model is really kind of answering questions for you, right? The, the more that you understand that theory of retrogenesis, that's the why, right? Why does mom do this? Or why can't my resident do that anymore, right? And then habilitation is really that, that uh, how, you know, how do I interact, you know, on, on what kind of basis, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, 
prescriptive engagement. And that's really the how component. And then there's the what, well, what do I use, right? And that's sensory-based tools, right? So this model really is a framework to kind of give you all the answers to how to really deeply connect with that person again, or to be able to connect in the first place if you're newly you know, taking care of them, like a resident that moves into your facility. So as I mentioned, you know, this is really something where it was developed over a 10 year period. And when people have used it, they've said, gosh, wow, you know, I wish that I had this when my mom had Alzheimer's, or I really wish that I knew this 10 years ago when I started in the field, right? So hopefully you can learn more about it. I wanna give you some resources at the end here to be able to do that. Uh, but the key here, right, is this is a cognitive behavioral approach. One of the first cognitive behavioral approaches in dementia care. And really think about it simply is as you influence them in a positive way using positive stimuli, you are influencing positive emotions, positive memories, and ultimately positive behavioral expressions. This may be. So when we talk about prescriptive engagement and Megan's gonna go ahead and put up a poll for you here to talk a little bit about uh, prescriptive engagement. But when we talk about prescriptive engagement, it's really about, you know, are we really kind of prescribing what is that positive sensory stimuli or what's gonna be that positive uh, interaction for them? What is their preferences, right? Are we prescribing those to our residents or to our loved ones every day? And how are we implementing that? So the question is, at what level does your team prescribe engagement? So choose the answer that best describes your team's regular practices. So what does it mean to prescribe engagement? Maybe you're there, maybe you're not familiar with that term. Uh, we assess our residents and provide programs based on their preferences. Or third, we engage based on preferences from assessments and information, but we also use evidence-based practices incorporated in that to really be able to lay out the day for them, right, of what that might look like. So where is your team at? Or if you're maybe a, um, a family caregiver, right, um, and you're on and you're in the field, um, what would that look like to you, okay? So go ahead and choose your best answer. Um, and then what Megan's gonna do is Megan's gonna go ahead and give us the poll here at the end of this slide. But I wanna talk a little bit more about this concept of prescriptive engagement, right? So again, when we are laying out the day of what could really bring them uh, quality of life, right? What would help them to have a better morning or what would their afternoon look like that can make them feel a little more safe and secure? Or as they're approaching maybe that sundowning hour, if they do sundown, what can make them feel calm, right? If we could have this idea every day and, and, and necessarily prescribe it to say to them, this is what the tools are that I'm gonna use every single day uh, to be able to help to improve their quality of life, why not do it, right? And so we call that prevention, right? We're being proactive by knowing the person um, to say, okay, I know that at this time they, uh, maybe get a little more irritable. They maybe get a little more aggressive, right? So maybe that's around 3.30. So, you know, referring to sundowning. So if we know that about that person, what can we do right before that to help to mitigate those behaviors, right? Or maybe you're saying, well, I don't, sometimes I don't even know my, I work in senior living. I don't know my residents like that. Maybe it's a brand new person who moved in, right? And so we look at the um, information that we do have from them and we try to start to pilot different things to see what works and what doesn't work, right? So when this situation occurs again, or, you know, the next day, let's go ahead and implement these things, knowing on what we have, maybe it's little information, and then you build your tools on top of that, right? So prevention is really going to be key here. When we talk about the perfect day or creating this perfect day, we want to be able to try to anticipate their needs and be able to intervene. So we adjust and we intervene previous to when this, you know, when they might have a negative behavioral expression, right? Um, because we want them to feel calm and safe and secure. We wanna reduce those fears, right? So an example of what we talk about with prescriptive engagement is, and part of the perfect day, which we'll get into, is maybe you start diffusing lavender essential oil, oil every day around 3.30 to try to really prevent those sundowny types of behavioral expressions. Right. And so if you do that every single day, one, the immediate effect is going to be there uh, based on the research of the dementia connection model. Right. It's going to be an immediate effect because they're bringing it in through the olfactory system here. It's influencing the limbic system in a positive way. Right. Positive emotions, positive memories, which will then influence positive behavioral expressions. Right. But then long term, they learn over a period of time what that smell means. And so when they smell lavender, 
their body physiologically reacts to calm down because their body has learned it over a four week period as well. And I say four weeks because it takes about four weeks for a person with, uh, who's living with dementia to learn something new because they're learning through their senses, just like small children and adolescents. They're not learning by reading a book or gathering information. They're learning differently than you and I, okay? So that would be how we prescribe, right? Better than reacting, right? We don't wanna just react to when it happens and they're full blown and sundowning, then to start to mitigate those behaviors. Now that may occur because we may not catch all the, you know, the, the things that may stimulate them in negative ways, but we learn about it and we try to change that for them. So we bring you the perfect day to really fill your toolbox. We talk about that often, right? What are sensory based tools that uh, we can use on a daily basis to really create this perfect day? So you see from auditory, visual, tactile, olfactory, gustatory, but we can't also forget about our sixth sense, which we talk about is cognitive. So when, you talk, when we talk about the perfect day, we really want the day to start with more high intensity activities, more stimulation. And then as the day progresses, we want it to, we want the day to really start to calm down, right? Um, so starting kind of towards the lunch hour, we want things to kind of start to calm down for that person. And the reason we do that is to try to, again, to train their body physiologically um, that they can be able to do this through these various sensory techniques. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why can't they just do that on their own? Well, they're not able to anymore because, again, you and I can cope in ways when we maybe get a little irritable as the day goes on or we get maybe a little more tired we know how to manage that. We can problem solve through those things, but people living with dementia, they're not able to do that, right? Very similarly to how adolescents can't do that as their day is progressing. And so we wanna make sure that we're trying to adjust the day for them. So that way it sets them up physiologically for success, okay? So let's dive into this because there's a lot here um, in terms of where to start. But think about this, as you're interacting, you are interacting in a way that is, um, where you're providing immediate intervention, but then there's also those long-term effects. Um, so wait, before we dive in, here are the results. So when we talk about um, at what level does your team prescribe engagement, 6% um, um, say that, what does it mean to prescribe engagement? So that's great. That means majority of you know what that means and that's fantastic. 41% um, provide um, programs based on, or engagement based on preferences and 52% dive into not only a preference information, but using that assessment information, using evidence-based uh, techniques, so that's great. So the Dementia Connection model is right up your alley. Fantastic, thank you for, for participating. So let's talk about in the morning. What should we do in the morning? So definitely in the morning, we wanna get those folks moving as much as possible, okay? It provides uh, tactile stimulation amongst others, depending on if you're doing it inside, outside, right? There might be some auditory, there might be some visual based on some other things that might accompany that movement. Uh, what we do know is that it creates the process of neuroplasticity to start, right? And if you're not familiar with that term, essentially it's rewiring the brain, but in a way that provides side benefits. And I'm going to talk about those side benefits, right? When uh, the, the brain is going through the process of neuroplasticity, it allows the person to be able to be more, more focused and more attentive and less anxious and less fearful, right? And that is a recipe for success for someone living with dementia. So we want them to be more focused and more attentive in the morning, of course, and calm, because we want them to start their day on a good note, right? So getting up and moving as much as possible is really a great way to start with that. Um, you'll see some other benefits there. It helps with um, proprioception, which is housing our parietal lobe back here. So being able to know where objects are around us. So it helps to reduce in falls. Um, it helps promote positive um, emotional expression and, and positive mood, right? And of course, can increase social interaction if it's in a group atmosphere. So the research has shown that um, when we are aging, the best uh, time frame to do this is really about two and a half hours a week. So that frequency. Uh, if you break that down, it could be anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes a day. So it doesn't have to be long drawn on exercise, uh, but definitely want to get them up and moving every day. Certainly check with their physician for any restrictions that might occur or if they recommend how many minutes or what kind of movement is appropriate for that person. But the idea is to expend their energy early in the day. You can also do that with cognitive stimulation, right? So doing various kinds of brain games and uh, different kinds of 
like fun interactions that they really enjoy, but what's their preferences, you know? So for example, like myself, I, I don't really enjoy crossword puzzles, but I love word searches. So what is, what's gonna bring this person positive stimuli that's gonna influence those emotions, memories, and behaviors? Now the recommendation for cognitive stimulation uh, for frequency is at least three times, uh, three days a week, excuse me, at 30 minutes at a time, okay? So research has shown that if we do more than that, it doesn't necessarily help our brain, but less than that, um, we aren't getting the full benefit, right? So uh, if we have a, a folks who are in charge of your activity calendars here on the call, definitely think about how often are you providing this within through the week and are you meeting the minimum standard, right? So three days a week at 30 minutes at a time. Now, someone living with dementia may not be able to sustain for 30 minutes um, in, a, in a session. So you might want to go down to maybe seven minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time, and that is uh, broken down maybe uh, more like five days a week or seven days a week uh, in order to meet uh, their level of, you know, what stage in the um, disease that they're in. Another thing that you can do in the morning is auditory stimulation. Now, this research comes from Harvard University, where they found when you play upbeat music with words of music that's familiar to them, that allows them to start to uh, use their verbal skills in the morning. And we want them to be able to do that so they can start feeling comfortable talking uh, and being able to engage with others. And so the reason they do that is because we typically will sing in our head to a song that we like or might sing aloud or hum to it. And that really kind of brushes the cobwebs off of our Broca's and Wernicke's areas of our brain in the morning. And we're able to then use our verbal expressions in a, in a better, more proficient way. Um, so uh, you can use that type of auditory stimulation in the morning. And then of course there's aromatherapy we can use as well. So aromatherapy can provide a lot of different benefits. It can, it can provide, excuse me, cognitive and olfactory stimulation, can be invigorating, increase appetite, de decrease discomfort, elevate the mood, your concentration, decrease fearful and anxious feelings, and can help suppress sun sundowning behaviors and aid in a restful night's sleep or a great bedtime routine. So there's lots of different benefits. And one of the great things about the essential oils is that one can provide many of these benefits. <clears throat> so why would you wanna use this? Um, one of the reasons why we bring essential oils into this is because they're safe often without side effects. We put that word often and kind of black there for you because well, they are plants and they are powerful. And, you know, when we think about cocaine or poison oak and, you know, those types of things, they oftentimes will not have side effects, but we have to know what we're talking about and which ones we need to bring in um, for our residents and loved ones. Uh, essential oils can restore homeostasis or balance to the body. So really what they want to do, and I'll give you a quick reference. I think most of us have smelled peppermint, right? We've all had a, a whiff of peppermint, whether it be essential oil or just the scent itself. And one of the things it does is it wants to open the airways, right? It's invigorating. And really what it's doing is it's restoring the body back to balance. So you have capillaries in your nose that can become constricted. And this happens with lots of different things like allergies, asthma, runny nose, things like that. Simply by breathing in that peppermint, it can alleviate those things. So it's restoring the body back to balance. It can have side benefits. One of the things that Dr. Stelter and I are always very happy about is being being able to bring tools that have multiple benefits. So one essential oil can have upwards of 35 health benefits. So while you might be choosing it for one particular area, you'll get all those side things going for it as well. Quick responses. We're going to talk a little bit about when we use it aromatically as well as topically, and it only takes about between 22 seconds and two minutes to start having an effect um, on a cellular level. And they can have positive psychological, pharmacological, and physiological benefits. So they can affect all parts of the body. So safety, we always want to talk about safety first, right? As long as we're using them safe, they can have amazing benefits. 
Uh, when we use them aromatically, you're always going to use a purified or distilled water if you're going to use diffusers. So if you see there, there's a picture of a diffuser. This is probably the least intimidating way to bring in essential oils for a community. However, um, in the later stages of dementia, we have some something called personal diffuser dots so that we don't have to worry about drinking the water and those types of things. Um, but with that, one of the things that I always want to point out is always use purified or distilled water. And the reason is, and I know a lot of times they say use tap water, there's an allowable amount of, of, of different types of metals and chemicals that are allowed in tap water. And essential oils, when they're breathed in aromatically, actually have the potential to cross the blood-brain barrier. So your tap water, if it has anything like that, those can cross with those essential oils. So we always wanna stay away from them. You always wanna follow directions. Um, typically, there's an amount of drops that'll be determined uh, based on the square footage that the diffuser allows. So you're choosing a diffuser on the size of the room, 400 square feet, 800 square feet, those types of things. However, if you are in later stages or you have later staged uh, uh, residents, you can use something called personal diffuser dots or diffuser jewelry. So they have diffuser jewelry that can go around the neck and you can just drop it on. And then it's kind of a personal diffuser as well. But also a personal diffuser dot is really, it's just sticky on one side and it's felt on the other. You drop three or four drops of essential oil onto that and you can go ahead and hide that somewhere like under the lapel or on the back of the shirt. And they walk around with a personal diffuser and they don't know it. That typically will last six to eight hours and then you just simply throw it away when it's done and make sure that that's off of the shirt before it's laundered. When we're talking about topical use, um, you, there's a couple of things to always keep in mind. One of the things that you always need to do is dilute with a carrier oil. Essential oils are typically steam distilled uh, or cold pressed, which really just equates to they are extremely concentrated. So if you put them on the skin and with our vintage folks, they have thinning skin. So about 92% of poor reactions actually have to do with the fact that people use them neat. We don't want to use them neat. We always want to dilute with carrier oil. A carrier oil is a fat soluble oil, coconut oil, jojoba oil, vitamin E oil, almond oil, anything like that. With our vintage folks, we typically will say a 10 to 1 ratio. So 10 drops of carrier oil to one drop of essential oil if you're going to use it topically. Never use for water. As a matter of fact, really the only reason an essential oil uh, from a chemistry standpoint is considered an oil is that it doesn't mix with water. So if someone's having a poor reaction, never use water because it will actually irritate it. Um, so always a carrier oil to dilute. Um, two drops per application per oil is usually the suggested amount, which would mean you would use 20 drops of carrier oil. And you use this about a, every four hours. So one of the things about essential oils is the body recognizes them as food and they metabolize a lot quicker through the body than an RX medication. So it has a shorter half-life, so frequency is going to be key. So about every four hours or so would be reapplication. You never want to place it in any orifice of the body. One of the unique things about essential oils, they work on a cellular level. So when you put them on topically or when you breathe them in, they actually will distribute through the body, um, through, through, uh, through, through the cells. Um, use a 1% dilution for the vintage. And again, that's just that 10 to 1 ratio. So when we talk about the per perfect day, Dr. Stelter and I just decided that we were going to choose certain essential oils that had different effects for different things that were going on with our dementia folks. Um, peppermint, peppermint essential oil. You heard me mention it before. This is one of our favorite essential oils for the morning. Um, peppermint oil has something called monoterpenes in them that is a chemical constituent and that is one of the things that's clinically trialed. So the great thing about essential oils is that they are clinically trialed for therapeutic benefit. And some of the things that, that shows that peppermint does um, is that it's, it's great for olfactory stimulation. It helps to focus the senses. Actually back in the 50s, teachers used to give students mints before a test because it improves their focus and their mental clarity allowing them to get higher scores on tests. So we've known this for years and years and years. It's high in a chemical uh, a constituent called monoterpenes, which is actually shown to oxygenate the brain up to 28% more than it's currently getting. 
right? So they're taking deeper breaths and they're, they're delivering more oxygen to that brain. Can promote a general arousal of attention. Remember, when you breathe in that peppermint, it's very invigorating. Promotes mental clarity, can invigorate the lungs. It can reduce nauseous feelings. Sometimes medications and stuff can create nausea. This can be a great tool to use as well. In the morning, different ways you can use them. You can diffuse this in the morning. You can wear it topically using those personal diffuser dots or jewelry, um, or mix with carrier oil to massage into the muscles. And one of the great things about using peppermint is that mints typically are cooling to the body. So this is great when we have different issues like pain, um, you know, or our bodies are getting warm. The other essential oil that we like to actually blend with peppermint in the morning is wild orange. So you'll actually do a peppermint and wild orange. Um, you know, wild orange smells just like orange, right? It's sweet, fresh, it's a citrus, um, very invigorating as well. You're gonna use this for olfactory stimulation. One of the neat things about uh, citrus is, is that it has a chemical constituent called limonene. And limonene is actually responsible for uh, uh, uplifting the mood. So if you have someone who's feeling down or in a depressive state, wild orange is a really great uh, essential oil to use. It energizes and invigorates the mind and body. It can increase appetite as most citruses can. Uh, you can blend with others for a refreshing aroma. Again, with the peppermint, great uh, morning routine. High in those monoterpenes, just like peppermint. Um, this is great to diffuse at breakfast and in activities. You can wear it topically to up, uh, uh, uplift the senses. But another great side benefit of wild orange is that it's very highly antibacterial. And so this is a really great thing to put into the air when we think about, you know, just kind of helping to maintain and support the immune system. And the last suggestion for the morning would be a rest period. Um, and so when I say the word rest period, it's a respectful way to say maybe a nap or maybe relaxation, but I like to use the word rest period to be respectful towards our folks with living with dementia. Their, their brain needs to rest, right? So they've gone through the morning, they maybe have had some physical activity, some cognitive uh, exercises, right? They have had other kinds of stimulation coming their way in a positive way, right? Now it's time to rest the brain, okay? So um, some folks maybe do this um, in the afternoon, um, some folks maybe do it after, you know, in the morning and after in the afternoon too. So it's important that we are um, allowing them that time if it is time for them to take a rest before lunch, okay? So it doesn't necessarily mean them having to close their eyes. It could also mean, again, using aromatherapy, some maybe light massage, yoga, meditation, right? So it could be different forms of relaxation, but we definitely need to build that time in for them to be able to rest their brain before the afternoon activities start, okay? Um, what we've seen and when this has happened is when we have some kind of structured rest period schedule for people living with dementia, and that would be based of course on their, um, you know, what stage of dementia that they're in. As the disease progresses, they're gonna have more rest periods than someone who's early on. Um, we found that it increases their mood, it decreases aggression. Um, they actually um, have more restful sleep and we actually see less falls, which leads to less skin tears, bruising, fractures, breaks, all those kinds of things. Now let's talk about early afternoon. So like around lunchtime, what are some interventions that we've found successful? Again, back to auditory stimulation uh, and to that research uh, through Harvard is that they recommend upbeat music with no words. And, we're, and music that's not really as familiar, like it's kind of background music, but it's pleasant, uplifting, maybe relaxing. And this allows them to socialize with others, maybe at their table or if they're visiting, you know, maybe they're visiting family at a restaurant, whatever it might be, it allows them to engage and socialize. So they're not distracted by the music, uh, but it's something that can still provide them that, that calmness or that uplifting, depending on what kind of music it is. And bergamot essential oil, for a great wellness dining plan, you can do this, you can diffuse this about 15 minutes prior to the resident or the loved one eating. Uh, bergamot is a citrus oil. One of the things here you see warning phototoxic, just to let you guys know, 
citrus oils are phototoxic. So if you're going to put, like if somebody's going to be outside, it would be much like adding uh, baby oil to the skin. So this is where you would want to use a personal diffuser dot or, you know, diffuser jewelry or something like that. So you don't want to put it on topically if they're going to be outside. Um, this helps to improve the appetite. It can alleviate stressful or anxious feelings. Citrus is typically what they do is they like to balance the serotonin and produce serot help to produce serotonin um, by sort of activating that neurotransmitter. So it's elevating the mood, alleviating stress and anxious feelings. Um, the chemical constituents that are in there is monoterpenes, as again, we talked about monoterpenes being really great for the brain, esters, alcohols, and aldehydes. One of the unique things about essential oils is that they are made up of hundreds of chemical constituents, which really create this synergistic relationship to create the therapeutic benefit that we see. Uses, you can use it topically with a carrier oil. Pulse points are best. When we're trying to get to the brain, if you will, with essential oils, you want them to breathe them in. So you want them to be aromatic. So if we're not diffusing or using like a personal diffuser dot and we'd rather put on topically, where you would like to put those on is pulse points the wrists, behind the ears, and the back of the neck. So that way they're getting it topically as well as aromatic. Um, diffuse at meals about 15 minutes prior is a great way to do this, um, or use on those personal diffuser dots or jewelry. And again, we come back to relaxation, right? Now it's in the app, you know, it's kind of right after lunch, you know, they've uh, they've had a good meal, you know, we have been able to stimulate them in positive ways, you know, sometimes folks like to go ahead and take that rest period again, so allow them to do that, right, rest that brain so they're prepared to move into the afternoon and early evening, which for some folks living with dementia can be more strenuous, right, as the, the day is going on, but again, we found that as they're able to have these rest periods, that sense of stress or that sense of anxiety or fear that comes as the day is uh, moving along, when they have that rest period, it is less likely for that to occur. Um, you might, if they don't want to take a rest, there might be something else you might want to do with them in that early afternoon, which is maybe some tactile stimuli. And again, we go back to the use of tactile stimuli like we did with exercise. It creates that process of neuroplasticity to start to occur. So this is going to allow them again to feel more focused and attentive but less anxious and less fearful. And that is perfect to move into the afternoon, right? Especially for our folks who sundown, we want them to feel less anxious and less fearful, right? So what are some things that they can do with their hands, right? Sitting, that would make them more comfortable. What is their preference that you can work in here of some of these activities that you see here on the slide from cooking and baking to maybe some cleaning to maybe some coloring, right? Things that they can do where they're not moving about a lot, uh, but they could focus and feel uh, engaged now let's move on to late afternoon, early evening. And again, think about when, if your resident sundown or your loved one sundowns, what is that time frame? It's usually around the same time every day. So about 15 to 30 minutes prior to that is when you want to start these interventions to be preventative, right? So again, we go back to auditory stimulation using that study. And they showed that um, you want to play non biharmic calming music so that's usually one instrument playing, like a violin, a flute, harp, whatever it might be, really calm in music. You also want to engage in things using tools that will help them feel purposeful, but yet calm and satisfied. So many of you may know about using therapeutic dolls. Now, certainly there's, you, there's room within your activity calendars or throughout the week that you can use different kind of intergenerational types of interactions with real children. But on a daily basis, we want to introduce the dolls that this is something that they really enjoy. So this is something that we recommend to use on a daily basis. And so essentially, it's, you want to make sure that your therapeutic doll it has about a five to ten pound, a five to eight pound weight to provide that true tactile stimuli, which again is going to produce those side benefits we talked about. But it also provides visual stimulation. And if your uh, doll happens to make noises, auditory stimulation, which can be very calming for them when they see that this, you know, what this represents to them. It provides a sense of nurturing, uh, purpose, unconditional love, right? It improves mood. And so really it's helpful in that it can really start to calm them down and feel like they are uh, being able to take care of something as the day is going along. Another, if they maybe don't, aren't, don't respond to doll, maybe they respond to pets, right? So you may be familiar with 
the uh, mechanical pets uh, that are on the market, um, you know, from Hasbro. But you can really use any pet as long as it has about a five to eight pound, again, weight to it that allows for that tactile stimuli to take place. But again, it provides visual and auditory stimulation depending on what your pet is that you choose. Um, but these mechanical animatronic pets are fabulous to meet all of those kinds of positive needs. Um, making sure you're choosing the pet that they enjoy. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? You know, sometimes there's a, there might be a bird on the market, you know, those kinds of things, right? Choosing the pet that will bring them that joy. So these, again, you wanna start about 15 to 30 minutes prior where they are being provided this positive stimuli in a relaxing way. And of course, there's an essential oil for that, right? Lavender essential oil. Lavender is actually the first essential oil that was ever discovered, and it was discovered for a burn. Uh, one of the things in my research, I've been teaching this for about 11 years now about essential oils, and one of the things that I think Western medicine poo-pooed, the use of essential oils, especially within the healthcare community, is that there were inconsistent results. So one of the things that we want to look for in an essential oil is we want to know that the, the essential oil is actually obtained from its land indigenous to that. Okay, so for example, you know, if you find frankincense and omen, it's going to have the climate, the soil and temperature are indicative to that plant or tree, and therefore will yield the highest medicinal benefit. I give you a little bit of a, a, you know, if you if you took a Florida orange tree and planted it in Chicago, Illinois, right, you might get a tree, you might even get an orange, but it's going to change it because of those those constituents that are there that that's going to change that uh, the way that that comes out. So we always want to find our essential oils from the lands indigenous to them. So if you're looking for that, I saw that question a lot, like where do you get your oils from? Um, unfortunately, about 86 or 87 percent of the uh, oils on the market are either adulterated or contaminated and because they're sold by brokers and perfumeries and that's because of lack of FDA regulation. Uh, so lavender is going to be awesome for the early evening, your sundowning, any time that you're seeing any type of anxious feelings, frustration, aggression, this is going to be a great tool for you. Okay, so this is great to decrease agitation during sundown calm anxious feelings. And again, you can use this in a diffuser. Um, we recommend about 30 minutes prior to you knowing, so being proactive with it. Um, using a bath with Epsom salts. If you're giving the resident a bath, this is a great way to incorporate another tool, right? So when you do this though, as remember, essential oils do not mix with water. So you have to use something to em uh, emulsify. Uh, with a bath, I use a cup of Epsom salts, you know, five or six drops of the essential oil that you want to use, throw it in there and it, it mixes real nice. You can massage using a carrier oil or again, using those personal diffuser dots. And even a bonus too, you can even put it on your doll. You can also put it on your pet, right? Because we can always uh, wash or launder some of those things too or, or wipe it down, which is wonderful. Yeah, a pillow, anything mm -hmm. like that. So let's dive into the evening. So what are some things that you can prescribe, right? Going back to that word for the evening, bedtime routine is going to be your key, right? So it's doing the same thing every single night, because again, they will, if, if you're providing that positive stimuli, they will, there will be an immediate effect on them, but also over about a four week period, they're going to learn what these things mean, right? As long as we're doing the same thing every single night. And so I would suggest doing the bedtime ADLs in the same way. So do we brush our teeth? wash our face, put our evening gown on, you know, is that the routine? Then let's do that every single day. Um, I would also recommend from a visual stimuli is to use contrasting sheets on the bed because if they're all one color, they may not know to go under the covers and we want them to have a nice comfortable sleep. So if they see that there are layers there, then they'll be able to uh, go underneath that and have a more comfortable sleep. Again, you can have those tactile objects available to them, which are going to, again, have those side benefits. So are they attracted to using the doll, using the animal, maybe a weighted blanket of some sort or another, maybe it's a pillow, you know, with um, an aroma on there of some sort, right, that calms them down. You can also use auditory stimulation. So again, that non biharmic music can be very soothing, but you can also use things like maybe they enjoy white noise, okay, maybe they enjoy a different other sound that helps to calm them. And if you need to, then a nightlight as well, if they tend to get up at night. And of course, lavender essential oil. This is gonna be throughout the night. 
we recommend that you don't use this topically at that time because as i told you before this will metabolize to the body so it only lasts about three or four hours so about halfway through the night they really won't be getting it so this is where you want to use a diffuser or those personal diffuser dots or drop it on a doll because it's going to last six to eight hours at night so this is going to be great as part of that bedtime routine it can be something that you use with the bath then do that every night right so it's going to also aid in sleep so it's not only going to help them fall asleep but it's going to help them stay asleep right Right? And, and to keep in that REM sleep. Some clinical trials show that the EEG patterns in the brain after simply breathing in lavender show a calm state. So in conclusion, you know, people with dementia, they thrive in, in a consistent environment, right? When we are uh, doing things routinely with them. And that's really how the dementia connect connection model was set up is you know, what is that positive stimuli that you can prescribe to your loved one, to your residents on a daily basis that's going to provide that structure and that consistent flow of sensory stimuli? Because what I've seen in my research is that when you um, are providing that positive stimuli, it's influencing positive feelings like feeling calm, safe and secure, right? To positive memories, they're associating those, uh, those positive feelings with you. Um, and then it's creating positive behavioral expressions, right? We've been able to um, uh, mitigate and lower sundowning behaviors. You know, we've been able to increase appetite. You know, uh, the research that I sh shared with you when we um, when I did this focus group in 2006, we were uh, focusing the perfect day more so around the dining process. And what we found after a three month period is that folks about 50% were eating more. Uh, so their appetite increased. And those who are on supplements, we were able to uh, discontinue 92% of all supplements. So people were eating real food. So it was unbelievable the results that we, we showed. So it can really promote successful behavioral expressions, connections, and outcomes. So some resources for you. Um, uh, if you get a chance, um, I wrote a book that came out last year called the, called the Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advance Alzheimer's Disease. It was published by Johns Hopkins, which talks about the model and the tools in there. You will walk away with a whole toolbox full of tools um, that are non-pharmacological in nature and sensory-based that you can use on a regular basis, really to equip you with whatever you might need. It goes through all the ADLs. It goes through um, all the different behavioral expressions and how to manage those uh, proactively. Um, also, um, we have put together the perfect day toolbox for you. So if you're looking to really dive more into aromatherapy, if you've not done that before, you can access all our olfactory toolboxes there at the website that you see. And last but not least, if you're looking to be trained more into what is the dementia connection model, how do I use it? Um, you can become a DCS with us, as well as you can become a trainer. If you want to be able to uh, learn to train people on the DCS and really help us with our mission, which is to train as many people as possible, um, then become a trainer with us as well. And you can go to our website. Um, so our website is uh, the dementia, it's dementiaconnectioninstitute.org, or you can simply contact us at support at neuroessence.org. Um, what uh, Megan's gonna do is she's gonna put in the chat box a link. Um, if you're interested in staying more informed about what we're doing here at the Institute, go ahead and click that link and you will be able to uh, stay informed. And then of course, we will email you actually a small gift um, of another more variety of, of tools for you. Um, so if you can do that, that would be great. So without further ado, I'm gonna go to some questions that have appeared in the Q&A. Uh, so question, how do we implement essential oils when we are a scent-free facility? Jessica, I'm gonna hand that to you. Okay, so this is this is a unique place to be. Um, you have to ask, right? So if you're a scent free facility, chances are this is not going to be approved for you because you will smell them. And so we don't suggest ingesting the essential oils unless you're working with a, a professional. So this might be something that might be out. So if it's scent free, unfortunately, you know, they're very, they're very influential and you will smell them throughout the, the building. And so the key is, you know, what are other tools in your toolbox? Absolutely. Um, so, so some professionals are hesitant to use diffusers due to having a fear of the residents ingesting the waters and oils. Can you talk to that, please? Absolutely. So again, as I said before, when you're in the earlier stages of dementia, this might be a really great tool. As they get into the later stages, if there's a question about that, or we want to just simply use an essential oil specific to that particular dementia patient, that's where those personal diffuser dots are going to come in. So the personal diffuser dots are 
are going to probably be your best bet within these facilities and communities. And then this last one, do you have to get permission from the family or doctor to use the oils? Dr. Stelter, I'm going to. Yeah, so it's really uh, what your organization is wanting to do. Um, when we've implemented aromatherapy programs in organizations, we do recommend that there is a very general doctor's order. They'll usually write may use essential oils. Um, and then their care plan will, of course, depict what, what essential oils when. Um, we've also seen some organizations want to create a consent form. It's not required, of course, because they're not FDA approved. However, your organization may say we want that. And so that's something that can be implemented as well. Um, so it's really organization based. There's no really rules around it necessarily. Um, I, you know, I've worked in senior living for 12 years plus and um, have gone through many annual surveys with public health surveyors just enamored by the use of aromatherapy. They have questions about it, but that's about as far as it goes, but they see the benefit. And so uh, with that said, I guess the more prepared as possible I would recommend is so if you're thinking maybe a consent, you're thinking maybe a doctor's order, go ahead and do that, but it's not required by any kind of state mandatory rule or even federally. So I think we have another question in here. Sorry, didn't um, OK. We're just at time. Oh, thank you, yeah. Charles. OK. No, I, yeah, we, um, go ahead and answer the question. Uh, no, it, it, dissipate, it dis disappeared, so. Yeah. OK, great. Well, if you don't mind on sharing my screen so I can just make a few announcements. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thank Stop you for having us. We appreciate your amazing presentation. And you probably noticed from the chat, people were very excited about your tips and, and some of uh, all the advice that you've been giving us on how to help um, our elders that live with cognitive change. So just in terms of very quick announcements before we wrap up today's webinar, uh, please welcome, you know, you're all welcome to our next um, uh, meeting, which is on November 8th. It is about one of the uh, deepest challenges that our industry is going through right now, which is obviously related to staffing. And so Chris Kramer from Leading Age will be uh, uh, partnering with Douglas Olson from this year Vision Center on um, opportunities and really kind of lessons on how to uh, fight this challenge. The other quick announcement we wanted to share, especially for Ohio friends, but everybody is invited is something related to Dementia Care Friends. So that's gonna be on November 10th. And then I, um, we are very excited to be partnering with a uh, publication called Senior Housing News. More on that uh, very soon, but please note uh, that date on November 9th, uh, 29th, where we will be discussing memory care challenges and trends, and we'll be looking at obviously 2023 and what we see is coming there. And then last but not least, we are so excited to be partnering with Dr. Cameron's Council organization, the Center for Applied Research in Dementia, to bring to you a whole half-day event called the International Montessori for Dementia Conference. So with that, I know we're slightly uh, past time, but thank you so much, Dr. Salter. Thank you so thank much, you. Jessica, for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a wonderful end of your day. Take care, everyone.